Okay, we're recording now. Thank you, Maddie. Uh, you can go ahead and move it to the next slide. Hello, everyone. I'm Carolyn Martin, and I am the host of the PNR Rendezvous webinar series. Today, we will be hearing from a former PNR coordinator, as well as from a longtime partner, both who have presented for us in the past. So it's always nice to have a former guest. First, let me go over a few housekeeping tips. We've already muted everyone as they join the webinar, which means that you will not be able to unmute yourselves. Questions may be answered during the presentation, but there will be an opportunity at the end of the presentation, or you will also have the option to be unmuted. But for now, go ahead and type your questions and comments in the chat box, but please make sure that those are sent out to all participants so we all see your questions. If you would like access to the closed captioning, the link is posted in the chat box for you to use. It is also visible in the lower right corner in the multimedia viewer. For attending today's PNR rendezvous, either live or via the recording, you can get an MLA CE credit. If you would like to receive this credit, please stay on the webinar, and at the end, we will provide you with that information. And please keep in mind, we would appreciate you taking the evaluation whether you want that CE or not. We are so glad to have former PNR coordinator Gail Kwame, who is now Assistant Director for Research and Education Services at the University of Georgia in Augusta, as well as another past presenter, Dave Young, who is a Professor and Community Health Specialist at the Extension Service and College of Nursing at Montana State University in Bozeman. So welcome to both of you. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you now. So great. Thanks, Carolyn. This is Gail. Thanks, everyone, for being here this afternoon. And um, this presentation is going to take you through a chronology of events that led up to a project um, in which Dave and I are currently involved. It's, the project is essentially um, over, but we did get a new cost extension through next August so that we can continue to do some presentation of the results of this study that we've been participating in. Um, but the first few slides of this presentation are some poll questions, and um, I'd like to ask Maddie to go ahead and um, present those. So the first question has to do with just um, where are you located, and you can see the um, NLM regions represented on this map, and then you can see each region and the states and territories that um, they represent. So if you wouldn't mind choosing the correct region in which you are located, it's just helpful and informational for Dave and I to um, learn a little bit about you all. All right, the answers are rolling in. Looks like the majority of people have, have uh, submitted their responses. All right. So I'm gonna close that poll. And we can see the results, right? Yeah. Okay. They should, be, they should be showing now. All right. So we've got eight in region, your region, region six, seven in the Midwest, uh, three in region eight, two in region one, one in region five, and one in region seven. So a pretty healthy distribution there. Thank yeah. you very much. All right, next is what is your professional affiliation? Are you a librarian or work in a library? Are you involved with law enforcement? Are you a healthcare professional? Are you a corrections healthcare professional, a researcher, or other? And if you fit more than one category, pick the one that best represents you. Oh, I, I, I made this one uh, multiple choice, so. Oh, very good, thank you. <laughs> It's like you read my mind, Maddie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can see the results coming in. All right. Looks like, okay, I think I'm going to close the poll. All right. Whoops, okay, so 20 more seconds. Um, if uh, anyone still has yet to submit their results, their responses, I mean. 
sometimes WebEx um, wants to do a little countdown. <laughs> and while we're waiting, I just need to offer a quick correction to Carolyn's introduction. I am not at the University of Georgia. I'm at Augusta University in Augusta. But we do have a partnership with the University of Georgia for our medical college. We have a cohort of students there in Athens on the um, University of Georgia campus. Um, but they are affiliated with us and get their uh, medical degrees from our university. So um, we do have a connection with the University of Georgia and our nursing school has roots up at the University of Georgia too. But they're about uh, two and a half hours. Well, they're probably like going from Seattle to Portland, going from here to uh, Atlanta. So a large majority of our participants, Dave, are librarians. We have a couple healthcare professionals, one health corrections, um, corrections health professional, and one researcher. So very good, thank you. All right, next is, what is your experience in working with the justice involved? Do you consider yourself an expert, some experience, neutral, minimal, or no experience? And I should mention um, another thing that did not, uh, was not included in um, Dave's introduction is that he is the chaplain at the um, county jail where he is there in Bozeman, Montana. So. Okay, about ready to close this poll too. So make sure you hit the um, submit button. Okay, just a few more seconds. All right. So that should be showing the res uh, the results now. All right, great. It's like we've got about two thirds that have no experience, but uh, the next uh, poll question will gauge interest. So we'll be curious to see that some experience, neutral and minimal. So no one that considers themselves an expert. But hopefully after this presentation, you'll feel a little more knowledgeable and aware. So thank you for those answers. The next question is about rating your interest in working with the justice involved. And maybe you don't know until you learn more, and that's okay too. All right, I'm going to close this poll. It's going to give that 20 second countdown. <laughs> <laughs> I think it wants to give people a chance to uh, hit that of, submit button. <laughs> the amount of time we should take to wash our hands. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's always longer than you think. Too. Yeah. <laughs> I have a song that I sing. <laughs> <laughs> I do too sometimes. <laughs> All right, we have four people extremely interested, 14 somewhat, five neutral, and thankfully nobody's not interested or not at all interested, not very much at all. So most people have at least some interest, and uh, that's great. Hopefully you'll feel more interested after this. So our last poll question has to do with trauma-informed institutions, and you'll see that on another slide there's a definitely a connection between trauma or what you're hearing a lot now are adverse childhood experiences and um, behaviors that can lead to incarceration. So um, more recently, there's a lot of attention being given to educating people about this and becoming trauma-informed. So this question has to do with that concept. So um, it's rating your awareness of trauma-informed institutions, and for the librarians on the call, there's even um, information out there about trauma-informed libraries and training opportunities for librarians to become trauma-informed. 
as well as other professionals, schools uh, uh, also. Okay, I think I'm going to close that. All right. There, there we go. All right, kind of a range of awareness there. And um, so as I say, we'll mention this a little bit on a later slide in the presentation, but um, I would encourage folks to do a little research about adverse childhood experiences and the connection between trauma and um, incarceration. All right, thanks everyone for taking the time to do that for us, that helps us. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started and give some information to just provide some background information and then some context for um, the projects that Dave and I are gonna be describing today. So first of all, just to start off with some definitions so that people have a common understanding of some of the terms and concepts that are gonna come up um, this afternoon. Um, so just so you understand, uh, a lot of people don't understand or realize that there is a differentiation between jails and prisons. Uh, jails are shorter term facilities, usually administered at the local level, either the county or a municipality. Um, inmates in jail usually have a shorter sentence of less than a year, and they're being held either pending a trial, awaiting sentencing, or perhaps a relief transfer to another facility. Whereas prisons are longer term facilities owned by the state or the federal government, and they typically hold felons with sentences of longer than a year. There are some private prisons out there as well that you may have read about in the media here and there. Um, an inmate is somebody who's in custody in a public institution who's held involuntarily through operation of law enforcement authorities. And then someone who's incarcerated is serving a term in a prison or a jail. Um, so justice involved is a broader term that talks to uh, any talks about anyone who's currently or has been involved with the criminal justice system. So either they're currently in jail or prison, they're in a free release status, perhaps in a transition facility, or under community supervision, or perhaps they have they're in pre-trial probation or parole status. So anybody who has been in any of those situations is defined as justice involved. And then um, we prefer to use the term returning citizens to folks who are released from incarceration, uh, removing um, the stigma of labels like ex-con, ex-offender, et cetera. Um, so folks who are being released are returning to their community. Um, we also, um, this, these projects that we're going to be describing today really are about health literacy for this particular population. And this is probably the newest hot off the press definition of health, uh, health literacy that you'll see. This is from Healthy People 2030. Um, they just are in the process of finalizing the framework for Healthy People 2030. Um, so the kind of traditional uh, definition of health literacy is under this first bullet point. This is one we've seen for many years now about individuals having the ability to find, understand, and use information and services to inform health-related decisions and actions for themselves and others. And uh, Healthy People 2030 has added uh, the concept of organizational health literacy, which is the degree to which organizations equitably enable individuals to find, understand, and use information and services to inform health related decisions. So um, the point of this is it takes the full burden off of the individual and also involves the organization that's providing information and services. Um, so it's kind of a two-way street as opposed to expecting all individuals to be health literate without support from the organizational side. Um, a little more context about the American criminal justice system, just so you get some ideas of the numbers here. There are about 2.3 million people uh, in the U.S. being held in prisons and jails. So there are about 719 state prisons, 109 federal prisons, 1,772 juvenile correctional facilities, over 3,000 local jails and 80 Indian country jails, and these numbers don't include military prisons or immigration detention facilities. So these are very large numbers that you see here. 
Um, over 11 million people are cycling through jails every year. And um, that means about one in 38 U.S. adults or 2.6% of the population are under some form of correctional supervision or are justice involved, as we mentioned earlier. And I think something a lot of people don't realize or recognize is that 95% of state prisoners are released back into their communities. Now, unfortunately, the next statistic speaks to recidivism, meaning they get you know, re-incarcerated uh, within a certain amount of time of being incarcerated the first time. So um, there's a lot of activity going on trying to reduce these numbers and help people function more successfully once they are released. Um, but it's important to know that people aren't in prison, you know, for the rest of their lives. A lot of people do come back out into the community. So, Dave, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you for a little while. There, I think I got unmuted. Is that right? Yep, I yeah. can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, welcome, everybody, to uh, our uh, webinar today uh, discussing the different aspects of the justice-involved population and health disparities among incarcerated populations. They're broad, um, and the definition of a health disparity population follows these guidelines. And um, the total in the population is compared to the health status of the general population. So, Gail, are you going to hit the slide button for me? Very good. The uh, Differences between the general population and the justice-involved population are on this slide. And uh, you can see as you go down there, it's much higher, of course, in our justice-involved population. One that I'd like to point out that is really, I think, off the map is a history of past trauma, whether it's uh, childhood trauma or uh, teen trauma or even adult trauma is very, very high, especially in some of our women's prisons. It's like 95 to 100 percent would score four or more on the ACE questionnaire compared to the general population of 12 percent. So next slide. Gail, do you want to mention anything about this slide? This uh, was launched. In, <laughs> yes, do you remember the year? Do you remember the year that you were there with a vendor table at? Uh, it was the Health Ministries Association in San Antonio. I do remember it was 2007. So oh, wow. um, that is where Dave and I first met. Was at a conference in San Antonio, Texas. As he mentioned, it was the Health Ministries Association. Um, and Carolyn mentioned I was a coordinator there at the Pacific Northwest Regional Office for several years. I was the consumer health person. And I really wanted to um, grow a relationship with parish nurses who do a lot of health training and screening in faith communities. And so I was attending the Health Ministries Association, and Dave was there as well. And um, I gave a presentation at that conference and also a staffing and exhibit, and my presentation had to do with health literacy. And um, Dave is a very passionate about health literacy and trying to um, improve health literacy in vulnerable populations. So he and I struck up a conversation and have been collaborating ever since. I guess I could say stirring up trouble at some level. But um, so um, anyway, that's where this kind of got started. And, and um, over the years, Dave has been in contact with me while I was there in Seattle and now I'm well in Georgia to um, Spark some activity around this um, type of project. So, Dave, I'll turn the microphone back over to you. Okay. Well, thanks for that intro. I was, couldn't remember the year, but I remember you used three words that provoked my interest at that time because uh, while at MSU I was writing grants, and you mentioned three words express, outreach, and uh, that rang a bell. And this slide shows that uh, several 
significant items happened in 2010 that really launched uh, our thoughts about the project. And one is that uh, Healthy People 2020 was launched, including uh, incarceration as a social determinant of health. And the Affordable Care Act uh, came out in March of 2010. And then the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services uh, produced the National Action Plan to Improve Health Literacy. So we had a real banner year. And while we have this slide, if you click on during your free time, click on that link at the bottom, you'll find some interesting data. Um, you may hear some sirens in the background. <laughs> but um, it's interesting that 85% of our juvenile uh, individuals interfacing with the court system are functionally low literate. And uh, what's further interesting is that we arrest them. And by doing so, uh, it decreases their possibility of fish, finishing high school. And we know that high school dropouts are 3.5 times more likely um, than high school graduates to be arrested during their lifetime, plus 63% uh, more likely to be incarcerated than their peers who go on to college. So, uh, and another interesting statistic on this connection between low literacy and incarceration is that seven out of 10 adult inmates cannot read beyond the fourth grade level. So, or even at the fourth grade level. So let's try the next slide and we'll talk about Express Outreach Awards. When I first saw these announced by uh, NLM, I uh, didn't see in their list of the disenfranchised, didn't see anything about the justice involved population. They talked about rural and minority and the standard list. So I called the office and I'm not sure, Gail, if I talked to you, but I said, would you consider an application of uh, improving health literacy with uh, inmates? And the answer was, send it in and we'll make a decision on it. So at least I didn't get a no. I got a maybe. And uh, these awards, if I recall right, were 15,000. Is that correct back then? That sounds right to me. Yep. Yeah, basically chump change even back in those years, but uh, they served as launching pads uh, for uh, two major grants that uh, have some national recognition. So that's great. Next slide. Just wanted to show you the collaborators here and I'm proud to say that our MSU Library and our Baltimore Public Library were key participants uh, as inmates were released from our county jail. We directed them to those locations uh, to get uh, online with respect to health insurance or other needs that they have. Next slide. So why promote health literacy? I usually have a slide with the Albert Einstein writing on a chalkboard in three letters, duh, with a question mark. Um, as you can see here, health is the number one predictor of health outcomes. It's a major cost factor. Just uh, in October this year, United Health Group uh, published a health brief showing that it's costing over 200 billion a year. And if we could improve health literacy, it would prevent nearly a million hospital visits and save over $25 billion a year. Inmates have a high incidence of chronic health conditions, as we've shown you, and we'll talk about some of those in the next slide. But chronic health conditions account for 75% of all of our health care expenditures across the United States and 70% of all the deaths. Did we lose you, Dave? He muted him. Dave, yeah. <laughs> well, I can continue. So, as oh, can okay, I'm I'm back. I think oh. my uh, computer went south on me and also automatically muted me. So, 
anyway, this, uh, I'm not sure where I left off, but the this is a list of the uh, chronic health conditions, and I was going to mention that the last one is of high significance because of the uh, substance abuse and mental health uh, comorbidity that we see in a lot of our inmates. Next slide. One of our biggest challenges in working with our county jail was uh, preparing a uh, offline system that they could use, the inmates could use, that would uh, mimic being on the internet and let them search for uh, health information, other things in the area of, of their interests in different diseases. And thankfully, because I work with Extension, we have a, a high-end uh, internet uh, IT division, and one of the guys took this on to help us build the internet in the box offline system. And these were some of the pieces that we put on to that internet in the box system. Our plan was to eventually package this on a CD that would allow us to transfer this onto a hard drive uh, in each of the seven desktop computers uh, in our uh, county jail. Next slide. So here are some of the key collaborators that were involved in helping us prepare um, the information that we included in our Internet in a Box offline system. I won't go through those, but uh, one that I always loved was the last one from the University of Michigan, a plain language medical dictionary, which you could click on uh, in a little box, the word or type in a word you were interested in, and it would give you the definition of that term. Next slide. I was just going to comment, David, um, sure. as you mentioned, we had to do that internet in a box system because people may not be aware that while people are incarcerated, they don't have access to the World Wide Web. So they can't just get on and surf the web while they're um, in, doing time uh, either in a jail or a prison. So that's why we had to make that work around. Good point. Thanks. Okay, next slide. So again, why health insurance literacy? Um, anywhere from 70 to 100% of individuals arrested and booked into county jails have no health insurance. And as we just saw, they have a high incidence of chronic health conditions. And when they're released, they are frequent users of our emergency department services, which are very high cost. And a lot of them aren't interested in uh, self-care management, but uh, that's one reason that we really focused on our study to improve uh, self-care self management techniques. And uh, thankfully, about the time we were working on this, uh, Medicaid expansion was moving across the country, which is a no-brainer, I think, for uh, most of the states that bought into Medicare ex expansion, it's very, very critical to our criminal justice reform efforts. Next slide. So this will just give you a, a view of what our um, intervention involved in our first study in the jail. We had six handouts, hard copy handouts that we provided to participants. Um, we had instructor-led workshops, which you'll see in a minute, and then we developed health education modules that consisted of PowerPoints and videos, and there were 12 different health modules that we prepared covering the following uh, subjects. And then we had self-directed study sections where participating inmates uh, could go to the computer lab in the county jail uh, at specific times during the week and uh, review the PowerPoints and the videos that were presented uh, the day before. So next slide. This will give you an idea of our workshop format. Uh, we originally designed our express outreach. Uh-oh, Dave, you got muted again. Yeah. 
Yeah, I did. My computer keeps it's. I think it's on a ten minute shutdown. So oh, no. for that. So uh, anyway, my um, what we had back to originally design our experimental design was to uh, capture. That's a bad term, but anyway, um, recruit seventy inmates and uh, uh, provide the class weekly over a period of five months. Uh, we would be involving each set of inmates of seven to ten inmates in a class setting in one room. We would, uh, of course, have the consent form filled out. They would do a pre-test and a post-test, but our um, experimental design would involve one week, about 12 contact hours. And this is showing you the times that um, we would be doing the lecture series or activity. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they were allowed, provided that they had good behavior and the officers let them go to the computer lab, uh, a two-hour time slot to go and sit by one of the uh, desktop Mod or uh, computers, and we had earphones so that they could listen and uh, study what was presented the day before. Then we would allow them an extra week after this week and do our post um, questionnaire. Next slide. Our biggest challenges are listed here. Um, when you are trying to have a classroom setting in a jail environment, uh, you never know what's going to happen next. And the worst thing is like a code blue alarm in the hospital where over the loudspeakers you hear lockdown, emergency lockdown, which means all inmates need to go to their appropriate cells and all volunteers like me need to get out of the jail. So uh, without paying $200. So uh, that was one of the biggest challenges, but also uh, the inmates that we were working with, sometimes one would get called out to meet with an attorney or a family member, or they would decide about halfway through the week they didn't like it or they wanted to sleep in, so they'd drop out. Some would get bailed out. Uh, some would get transferred to other facilities or released, um, or some ended up in solitary confinement because bad behavior. So. Uh, Next slide. So our lessons learned from that round, and we ended up with uh, two studies. And if you're interested, you can contact me. Both of those studies have been published, one on improving health literacy and one improving health insurance literacy and enrollment working with inmates. Uh, we learned a lot from our first study. Um, it was well received. Uh, the 39 inmates that did finish the project and complete everything, including the 12 contact hours of instruction and the computer lab assignments on Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, they learn more about health literacy, numerical and financial literacy, health insurance literacy, and relationship education. Um, they also uh, were uh, up to date on coverage for inmates, and uh, we were able to get some actually um, a heads up and a lead start on applying for Medicaid expansion when they were released. So that's the end of my slides. Gail, it's yours. They'll be back, don't worry. So those two projects were um, essentially the inspiration for this current grant project in which we're involved from the National Library of Medicine. It's a three-year, and now as I mentioned, we have a one-year no-cost extension, $300,000 grant. Um, it's an information resource grant to reduce health disparities. And I've highlighted in red here some of the requirements or focus of these grants. Uh, that are particularly relevant to us to provide usable health information to health disparity populations. And we certainly illustrated that the justice involved are a health disparity population. Um, and they are to exploit the capabilities of computer and information technology 
and Health Sciences Library. So this grant requ requires the involvement of a Health Sciences Librarian. So um, also, oh, I'll get into this in a moment. So I came here to Augusta back in 2016 and um, was interested in building on the work that um, Dave and I and his group had done there in Bozeman and um, discovered that there was an Institute of Public and Preventive Health here on campus that had several researchers that were involved in projects involving the justice involved. And also, Augusta University has a contract with the state of Georgia to provide um, the health care for corrections facilities throughout the state. So a lot of our health sciences uh, students and residents have rotations in those facilities. Um, so when I saw this grant opportunity, I approached the Institute of Public and Preventive Health and uh, kind of cold called them. I mean, I really had not been here very long when this opportunity came up and um, asked if they would be interested in partnering uh, to submit an application for this grant. And um, I had Dave in my back pocket too, so uh, he was brought in right at the beginning of this whole conversation. Um, so there are four specific aims of the study that uh, we have essentially completed now. The first was to do a health needs assessment to determine the health information needs. We thought we ha had a pretty good idea based on the former projects that we had done and the health topics that we had covered. We used community experts there in Bozeman to inform us and provide content uh, for that first health literacy project that Dave was discussing. Um, but we wanted to make sure we were on the right track. And one of the differences between those first two studies and this third one is that there are no females uh, at the county detention center in Bozeman. And some of the corrections facilities in the first study do have women. So we wanted to make sure we didn't miss something. And in, indeed, we ended up adding some topics that were relevant to uh, the female uh, population. And then, um, our second aim was to develop health information curricula and training materials uh, to the justice involved who are currently incarcerated at five um, partner sites that have the Adobo tablet computers, and Dave's going to talk about those in a minute. Our third measure was to measure the impact of providing that training and curriculum. Um, and then our fourth aim, and we'll talk about the challenge of this one uh, in a little while was to follow a sample of justice involved individuals uh, for six months or after they've been released for, for six months and collect some data from them uh, based on our study and see what the outcomes were. So Dave, do you want to share a little bit about how we got Adobo involved? Right. Uh, just to, for chronology's sake, uh, mentioned that our first Express Outreach Award uh, was launched in October 2011 and then second one in uh, October of 2013. Well, in 2013, the group in Chicago uh, formed what was called Jail Education Solutions, or JES, and this was in 2013. And then it transitioned uh, in 2016 to EDOVO, which is a kind of an acronym for Education Over Obstacles. And uh, about that time in that interim between 2013 and 2016, I contacted uh, what was then Jail Education Solutions and talked to them about our 12 um, health education modules and whether it would be applicable to put them onto their tablet. And uh, that eventually came to fruition along with the current grant that uh, Gail was talking about. And just a brief note about Adobo, currently they have de uh, deployed 9,000 tablets in uh, plus 3,000 uh, software as service or SaaS tablets in 124 correctional facilities across 25 states uh, so that they are um, very actively involved. They're unique because they're working on education, rehabilitation, and reentry, those three pieces of uh, what's very important to criminal justice reform.
Thanks, Dave. And I will say that they uh, were an absolute pleasure to work with on this project. Uh, they were doing a lot of things behind the scenes, which you'll see as I continue with this next section. Um, there is a question in the chat, Dave. Um, is there a study or information on the typical age that inmates are released? Usable health information for an 18-year-old and a 50-year-old would be quite different. That's that's a great question. I can do some investigating on that. If the person would send me an email, uh, recently I saw where, um, actually it's an article at our jails and um, prisons are not equipped to be healthcare facilities, but they actually are because of the aging of inmates. Over 300,000 inmates across the United States are age 50 or over. So there's a lot of geriatric concerns along with being highly susceptible to COVID. Um, that I could do a, a, a look at that, that age distribution uh, for being released. All right, thank you. All right, so getting back to um, what we did with this project. Um, we did administer that needs assessment that I mentioned earlier via the tablets, and we did that at all Adobe facilities um, where the tablets had been deployed. So it was not just the five that ended up participating, that ended up participating in the um, later study. So um, we kind of seeded some of the questions with some of the topics that we had in mind, but also got good feedback. Uh, from this needs assessment, and we were thrilled at the uh, number of participants. There was over 1,800 respondents to this needs assessment, so we were really pleased with a very good sample of work. And then um, we did the actual research study also via the tablets at 10 participant corrections facilities, um, and that study took place for a year, February through February, um, and the uh, participants did consent to um, participate, and um, we decided that we wanted to create a video uh, with the consent as well as provide it in writing because we knew the literacy concerns with this population and did not want to provide a wall of text as the consent language but to have an alternative. Um, the eligibility for this study was that they had to be at least 18 years old and have at least 21 and uh, no more than 180 days remaining on their sentence. So this video, and uh, my colleague, Aaron uh, Johnson here, decided to pick the most unflattering photos of both him and me. But anyway, um, this turned into be one of uh, the challenges of this project. We um, worked with our folks here on campus at Augusta who produce videos uh, campus-wide. And it took a long time to get in the queue and on their list to get this completed. Um, once we got it, it was, you know, quite high quality and it involved both us speaking and then we kind of hit the highlights by putting text across the bottom of the screen where we really wanted them to make sure they saw the information. Um, and it's the most gripping eight minute video that you could ever imagine, but it was absolutely required um, by our IRB. Yes, Gail, could, Gail, this is Dave. Could you share that link uh, so they could see the actually watch it? Uh, and yeah. tell them <laughs> I can't imagine anybody would really want to watch it, seriously. Yeah, but you yeah. need to tell them that these two photos are at their local uh, post office. <laughs> if you really want to see the video, email me and I'm happy to send you uh, the file. Um, but, you know, one of the bugaboos of this is that we did incentivize this project uh, for the participants and um, our university required that we use a very specific kind of card called a CLIN card. So part of the um, content of the consent language had to do with all of the ins and outs of how to use that card and blah, blah, blah. And we asked our IRB if we could pare down some of that language, and they said, nope, you cannot. So again, it's, you know, edge of your seat stuff. Now listen, I'll tell you, the folks that actually sat through this and finished this study deserve very high marks because they had to sit through that consent video um, or consent with the PDF file in order to move on and participate. 
That said, I will say all of the content was re available to any of the inmates without having to participate in the study. Um, so just so you know that. So we grouped these health education modules and the topics where you'll see a list shortly were very similar to the topics you saw earlier in terms of chronic health conditions that are confronted by this population. But we grouped them all together as what's called a goal in the Adobo system. So it's kind of like a class all grouped together. We also did the pre and post intervention questionnaires through the tablets. And um, Adobo was able to push out reminder messages to people who had um, consented or access content but hadn't yet completed the questionnaires. Um, I mentioned that there was incentivization um, using these clean cards. And then um, contact information for the project was distributed um, to hopefully facilitate that post release follow up. So this is um, this thing circled in red is what our particular content looked like. And they called it improving your health knowledge. Um, so you can see on the Adobo screen they have a choice to say discovery goals or my Adobo. And this was grouped under the goals. And each individual could be tracked because um, they're each given a unique login um, for the tablet. So these are the module kind of grouped themes under which we have the different uh, content pieces, advocacy and self-care, preventive care, addiction, substance abuse, pain management, which was a new topic. This is one of the ones that was an outcome of our needs assessment. Um, sexual and reproductive health, another one um, out of the needs assessment and incorporating the um, women's health that was not in the original study. Mental health, nutrition and physical activity, anxiety and depression, which included suicide and suicide prevention. Dental health, smoking cessation. Um, another thing they were very interested in learning more about medications and lab results, and then health insurance as a tag along to the second project that Dave discussed. Um, so we collected data about uh, which modules were accessed and we were emailed data dashboards every week to see the activity there. And then the data from the pre and post intervention questionnaires was collected and managed in Adobo and then they sent us that raw data that we could then use for um, analysis. So we um, had over 3,000 individuals that accessed at least one educational module. We had 453 individuals that completed the introductory material and consented, and then all in all, 112 people completed all phases of the research. So I'm gonna wind you with a little bit of science here with some charts, but these charts represent the data from these 112 individuals that uh, completed all phases. So just very briefly, you can see the demographics here, and this speaks a little bit to the question about age. Um, the majority of participants were male, but of course the majority of inmates are male, white, and had completed high school and were between the ages of 35 and 44. Um, so that's just a general summary of this slide. And we, the questionnaires were broken down into kind of three areas. We had questions to measure health literacy, including some questions that were adapted from the newest vital sign, which includes a nutritional label, so you may be familiar with that. Then we asked them some questions about the importance of certain health behaviors, and then some important uh, questions about their confidence in performing certain health-related behaviors. So these next three slides are gonna show you the results from those. Again, it's kind of small, but you'll see the pre is the gray, the post is the orange. And uh, in this particular set of questions, there were two that were definitely statistically significant. Um, searching for health information, and um, health status, and then there was one about a uh, nutrition label that was um, the p-value was the 0.05, but overall there was a statistical significantly, statistically significant improvement um, around total the health literacy questions um, aggregate. Then the health behaviors, every question um, there was improvement between pre and post um, between uh, around these different topics, asking about, um, you know, awareness of mood, engaging in preventive care, tracking labs, and whatnot, and uh, statistically significant difference at the aggregate level as well. 
And then the confidence questions also almost all were statistically significant um, where they showed improvement in confidence about these different topics about where to seek health care, understanding medical tests, understanding their diagnoses or not. Um, we only had nine people in the end that uh, completed their surveys about six months after being released. And um, part of the reason for that low, low number is that it's just very hard to keep track of these folks once they go back to the community. And this is not their primary motivation to participate in something like this. You know, they're looking for work, they're looking for housing, and they're reconnecting with family. Um, so, you know, in hindsight, we probably should not have included this in the study, to be perfectly honest. We worked really hard to try to get them different ways to contact us. We sent postcards out to the participating corrections facilities with our contact information. Um, so the fact that we got anybody to contact us at all is kind of miraculous, truthfully. Um, so, but these are some interesting outcomes of, of these numbers. Seven of the nine said that they had some type of health insurance in the past six months. Uh, seven, six, seven of nine answered at least 80% of the nutritional label comprehension questions correctly. Seven reporting currently taking prescribed medication and four of those were not taking the medications as prescribed. Six reported visiting a doctor, nurse, or other healthcare provider. Uh, five reported being involved in treatment programs. Five reported being confident or very confident in understanding medications, filling out medical forms, or providing assistance to a friend or family member who has a healthcare need. Four reported visiting an emergency room or urgent care center, and four reported having problems learning about their health and written information because it's hard to read. And I should say um, this uh, bullet point about providing assistance for a friend or a family member, one of the, um, in the, the first study that Dave described, we did have an opportunity for folks to provide some narrative comments and follow up on the follow up. And one of the participants said he was better able to take care of his elderly parents as a result of getting the training through that project. So that was really gratifying for us to see. And it got that person you know, to focus on um, doing something positive for his folks. So the conclusions of, um, of this study are that providing health education modules paired with self-directed learning on the tablets is an effective method for improving health literacy and self-care management. Um, we did not find a strong correlation between gender, race, or education level and health literacy or self-care um, based on the findings of this particular study. So um, some of the challenges on this project were um, just learning to speak each other's language, learning to speak the language of the you know, corrections world, as well as Adobo working with library speak and health speak and all of that. We also had to really learn how this whole tablet system worked and adapt our research design to fit that technology. Um, navigating the memoranda of understanding with the participating corrections facilities, we actually ended up having to drop a facility just due to some bureaucratic um, headaches. Um, I mentioned the challenges around that video consent. Um, and also, we just weren't sure how successful we would be in attracting the population to this at all, whether or not they would enroll, how they would apply and use the information. And I think I've spoken already to, you know, kind of the post-release follow-up and some of the challenges associated with that. So um, Dave often gets folks asking him, if I want to work with this population, how can I get started? So Dave, I'll let you speak to this for a couple of minutes. Well, there are two uh, key stakeholders in, in most of uh, the work with the county jail and uh, or a state prison. But with the county jail, it is the sheriff's office and the sheriff and the uh, administrator of the jail. And we had good relationships with both of those individuals, plus we're one of the few jails that has a full-time program director, and we have 40 different programs in our jail, 
involving 160 volunteers. So, um, yeah, everything just fell into place for us. And um, I've always said uh, that incarceration is bad for your health. And I just sent out a note, hopefully it'll go to everybody, that I uh, just um, Googled that uh, not only is incarceration bad for your health, but for every year you spend in prison, it reduces your life expectancy by two years. So there's a one to two ratio there that uh, as you spend more time in prison, it decreases your life expectancy. So um, again, our project uh, was really moved along fairly smoothly, considering uh, all the uh, hurdles that we had to jump over. And uh, we're coming up on the hour, so Gail, we don't have to answer any questions. Um, I will say another way to get involved is uh, Dave's use of the word uh, volunteer. There's a lot of um, often opportunities to volunteer at um, local corrections facilities too. So that's another avenue to explore if you want to kind of dip your toe in the water um, and uh, see if this is something you might be interested in pursuing further. So in spite of Dave trying to get out of it, we do have a few more. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, if people have any questions, if you'd like to unmute or if you want to put it in chat, up to you. Well, thank you, Dave and Gail. Um, many of us are, you know, are involved in outreach in the community with a focus on underserved populations. And uh, persons who are incarcerated or recently released are often overlooked in their needs. So thank you for bringing awareness as well as highlighting your work. And I also appreciated your definitions because I realized I've been using wrong terminology, so that was good to, to learn. Um, and before we take questions, I just want to make sure that those who may have to leave early have a link to our session evaluation, and we will put that in the chat box. Um, and there's information to get your Medical Library Association CE within that evaluation. And again, we would appreciate your feedback, whether you want the CE or not. And as I said earlier in the session, if you would like to be unmuted, there is a little gray hand above the chat box that you can click on, and Maddie can um, unmute you if you would prefer to talk verbally, or if you want to just go ahead and put your question or comment in the chat box, that's fine as well. Did, uh, I'm not sure if we saw any, missed anything. I don't know if Brenda saw um, that Dave did sign an answer to her question about the average age at release is 36, uh, but that's that's uh, data from 2013. But that kind of parallels our data about uh, with the you know the age of the folks who were participating in our study too. They fell right about into that window. Oh, and Brenda says, uh, this has been an eye-opening session, so um, <laughs> definitely it's been very informative. Um, yeah, I, this is Dave, one eye-opener thing that, uh, and I think I have a, a chart um, on that, that there's been a, a precipitous increase in uh, incarceration of women in the last decade, it's its unbelievable. It went like something from 20,000 to 212,000 um, off the map. And a lot of it's related to drug possession. Um, as you probably know, we now have 12 states uh, that were recreational or where marijuana is legalized. Uh, we're Montana's just moving into that in 2021, and you have to be 21 years of age. So uh, one of the difficulties in collecting data is separating that adult versus uh, juvenile uh, data system. Any other questions or comments? I know we're just hitting the top of the hour here. All right, well, it looks well, like uh, Well, let's go ahead and um, before we leave, I, let me announce what next piano uh, rendezvous session is. 
Maddie, do you have? Oh, I handed you the ball. Oh, so you just. I'm it. sorry. <laughs> I'll <laughs> no. go ahead. And do, I'll go ahead and do that then. There is a. We already talked about the link to the evaluation, and this is the next session, which will be on February 17th in 2021 when Mandy Easter will be addressing how best to serve library users who are living with a mental health issue. You can also check our PNR Rendezvous webpage for upcoming sessions and to link you to the past recordings. Um, the link is there in the chat box. So thank you both Gail and Dave. This has been a great session, very interesting, and we appreciate your taking time to come and present for us. And thank you attendees for coming. Uh, we appreciate your attendance as well. So thank you all and have a great rest of the afternoon. Thanks for the thank opportunity. Thank you. Sure, thank you.